There? Um, you're, yes, you hit the red. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Evolution. Early summer morning in the garden, look beneath the hosta, look beneath the dewy pot of white geraniums. It's another dawn patrol for gastropods, another day to teach them, arcing them into the sky, high out over river road, learn to fly, but they never even peek out to enjoy the view that few in their cast can. If there was ever a time for rapid evolution, this is it. Yet they should succeed, they'll return to procreate in the trees around my garden. And later, they'll be diving out of the sun for a strafing run at my foxgloves before angling back into the heavens, their tiny silk scarves streaming behind them. <laughs> Awakening to blood in the urine, wondering what's next, as if life is but an exotic excursion by train through the dark organs of Europe. Next stop, Lake Lugano, Lithuania, or perhaps tiny Liechtenstein. Most of these are travel related, and um, they're travel from all over the place. Steen's Mountain, full moon. Someone said this was once a savanna, stippled with oaks and silver maples. Someone else said it was the bottom of the sea. See, she said, scuffling up seashells with her boot. At the museum in La Grande, just past the gloomy story of how the passenger pigeon absquatulated, and before you arrive at the glass case with the startling pizzle collection, there's a daguerreotype showing the mountain in 1848. Beside it, another shot, a hundred years later, by Ansel Adams. The moon hangs there in his sky, a disc of camembert, or one of those fancy cheeses from a dank French cave and unavailable at the mercantile. Coming down 205, the Neville brothers are blasting yellow moon from Roscoe's car radio. Yellow moon, they sing, yellow moon, yellow moon, and there's hardly any left in September. The moon hangs frozen some nights there in the heat, everyone seeing it first for the last time, the dark rising with the smoky orange disc. Most folks bunk at the French Glen Hotel. No neon, no elk heads on the wall. Varnished tables with birders pontificating about the bombastic cries of cranes. The old ladies are out, and the bald guys with binoculars, the Nikons, city dwellers, they're talking about sage grouse on the screen porch. In the parking lot, the bird shooters are feeding their dogs before their annual culling of the birds. Not a propitious time for immigrants. Roscoe, the cook, is smoking out on the back steps. What begets sadness? The moon is still rising, but the moon's a lonely thing, invisible from the back porch. The letters don't come from the woman in California anymore. Later, the birders and duck hunters will sit down to pork chops and red cabbage, served family style, and blueberries and raspberries from the back porch freezer, baked into a crisp for dessert. We're feeling copacetic, smug, well-fed, with just enough rye whiskey from the shared canteen to make even a foundling into a family member for a little while. One of the books I have here is a series of uh, postcards sent out last August with uh, photographs of different scenes. They're, I think they're all from France. And uh, there's a poem with each one, and this is one of those. Pont de Gare. 1900 years ago, before you were born, the Romans built this aqueduct to attract American tourists. It wasn't really the Romans, it was their slaves, an old way of doing things still popular in parts of the world today. Greek holidays. August is galloping up like a happy dog. By the time it arrives, fate will have cobbled up some brand new reason for us to head to the lifeboat station on the promenade deck. My people are from beyond the Blue Mountains, 
but we're still your comrades, your brothers. Some collect cardboard to sell, others push wheeled hampers full of towels from hotels. Most days, there's dust everywhere. The sky is white, credit dries up, a body hits the asphalt. The riot police wait behind the archaeology museum, empty blue buses with steel grills at the windows, foreign debt, cruise ships, Kalamata olives and feta on a white plate, all the treasures purchased. Yesterday I thought I heard someone say, today in paradise it will be 75 and sunny, but we were running at the time, so perhaps I misunderstood what was being said. I like to combine graphics with uh, poetry, and almost no editors like to see that. But I do it on my own thing. And this has a small picture with a Winslow Homer uh, painting above it. Deep sea fishing. Deep sea fishing to me has always been Hemingway off Cuba in the late 40s. There's a high green sea, and off to port is a second boat for Winslow Homer to use should he come back from the dead to paint another masterful seascape appropriately titled Hemingway off Cuba. Today it will be owned by a consortium of Chinese businessmen who bought it sight unseen for $13 million and put it into a fireproof vault in the Asakido Tower in Shanghai. But that's off the point, really. We're talking about fishing. Ken Burns is making a movie about Winslow Homer. It's in black and white because he's Ken Burns, after all. He has an effect. It's called moving the camera. Sometimes he zooms and fades, but always in black and white. Color, he said, is so invasive. I don't want a string of gaudy beans, beads. I want pearls, he said, fading and zooming. We arrive with Ken at the Asakido Tower to set up for stills of Hemingway off Cuba. The syndicate will display it for an hour for $4 million U.S., a significant portion of the budget. Although it never reminds me of Hemingway, still fishing in his boat there on the green waves. He wears blue canvas pants, cut off at the ankle, and a white shirt like the locals. He's dressed for the painter, but so far, no painter has shown up. Just then, a marlin, a big blue-black mother, breaks the sea. This is for a friend with difficulties. A small private hospital. Wet plastic trays. Too much swan for dinner, and they've lost the key to something important. Geese rowing the blue-black sky into night. Hollyhocks beside the loading dock at the rail spur. And they've thrown away the key. It's that nasty little taste before the vomit. September now, and the hollyhocks old and dusty. Remember, a good woman is pastis, hollandaise, and poached eggs. Awakening, thinking of you there, locked away. A good woman is not a life raft, ozone or snow. No belt, no shoelaces. We trust you only with latex. Waiting, awake, thinking, locked away. A thorn served with a dollop of peach chutney. We trust you with pastis, sometimes with snow always remembering summer and hollyhocks. I was kidding about the peach chutney. One needs some comedy to maintain the illusion of sanity. Buckle up for the flight, but we remember summer in the Palouse, grain elevators, hollyhocks, and gin. They've thrown away the key, and it's a long flight in the middle seat. No beverage service. The same fall colors covering the Palouse are muted. The swan labors into remembered air. at the edge of town. On each side of the path, agapanthus bloom, that particular purple that reminds me of Golden Gate Park, tomato sandwiches, soft-boiled eggs, insipid truisms that are tattooed on the body politic. We find what we look for, rivers with no sea left to flow, flow into. One waits on Narodny for the number 22 tram. The Venetian woman said, Pay cash, it leaves no footprints in the snow. 
your foot's asleep in this village where the houses are salt boxes, the trees are broccoli, milk cartons tower over your head, summer winds blow beer crayons across the playgrounds. We are what we eat, pine cones. I surmise by your footwear that you are from elsewhere, said the man with silver eagles on his green uniform. And there is relative quiet except for the peanut shells and the squadron of huge round beetles. We're always opting for the deck chairs, blankets, and hot bouillon on the North Atlantic run. The art book of color photographs of papyrus, the photograph chooses a the photographer chooses a black background for the graves of our forebearers, our ancient lovers, concealing what was once known. At the edge of town, the long grasses grow green in spring, but are fodder for wildfires come September. Buckle up. We'll be lucky to kiss our way through till next year. If we don't, we don't. Have a refreshing, a refreshing glass of chilled rosé or a cake donut with cinnamon and sugar. Every year I'm back like ozone before the next storm. The sky all Shostakovich and hubcaps. Time to buy a ticket for the rickety tram. Insert your coins and watch them pass down through the intricate mechanism into the bowels of the device, pulled down by the same gravity that draws us all. Well, maybe this is a little lighter. <laughs> Lost luggage. It's not possible that the luggage will arrive at its appointed destination. There's no path, no ribbons of different colored tied to one's valise. Steamer trunks painted orange and stenciled with the name of your dog, Spot, or your god, or dear Roscoe, your firstborn. It won't be waiting for you on the carousel. In this universe, nothing is to be expected or predicted. Was the trunk as orange as it could be? Think the world's air traffic security system can help find that cardboard box wrapped with duct tape? It's gone the way of the canine corps. It won't help. It will never arrive where it's needed. So what's wrong with your own damn backyard? Why do you even want to travel? France has roads and trees, but so does home. And there they speak Greek or French or Afrikaners. Stay home, unpack that case, the boxes of your special drugs and your orthopedic underwear, those lemon yellow slacks you insist on wearing everywhere. Put the suitcase back under the bed, take the euros back down to the bank and cash them in for American buckolas. Tell them you're sorry, you changed your mind, it was all a mistake and you've learned your lesson. Next vacation, you'll be heading out in the car for the Grand Canyon, for the Painted Desert, for Las Cruces, the Mississippi, all the Stuckies in Georgia, and finally Williamsburg. And when you get there, it's full of strangers, Chinese tour groups and candy cane girls in their striped outfits. Stay home. You know what they say about strangers? They're strange. Even the French think so. <laughs> A lot of these now are from a trip we just got back from a few weeks ago. I don't sleep well when I travel. Night train. When I awake, there's the waning moon fixed with the fragments of a dream. A tiger springed, ha spring halted in midair, an endless room. The dead come back with their embarrassed smiles. Again, my private coach has been detached from the train of sleep and shunted now to some siding where the rails rust and the weed grow tall under the bright moon. In the distance, the engine whistles as it picks up speed, its great driving wheels pulling its string of dark coaches further and further into the night. The cafe across the river the Patron, where I occasionally go on hot late afternoons for a glass of rosé, will close his restaurant soon for the winter. He's off to Mauritius for some sun. There the resorts on Turtle Bay import white sand to make their rocky beaches worth 400 euros a night. Here the tourists have gone back to London, Paris, or Berlin. The broad grape leaves shading his outdoor tables are golden. 
This soon the winter sun will be free to flood his empty terrace, the, and as the river rising floods the field behind, where all summer English caravans are parked in rows like the bodies of swans. Having a French cell phone is fun too. Perhaps I could call you if I could find the instruction book that didn't come with my new phone. <laughs> Hello, I'd say, it's me. I'm calling on my new phone. And you'd say something appropriate, and then I'd be tongue-tied. I never liked to talk on the phone in the first place, even on a new shiny black phone that's the size of a pack of cigarettes run over by a steamroller. But of course, I don't smoke anymore, and it, but in the old days, a phone as modern as this technological wonder would have included a cigarette lighter. But as I say, I don't smoke anymore, and anyway, I don't know your phone number. <laughs> prunes. On a day best spent getting lost on some curvy, sun-dappled French road, cranking through the gears, downshifting into shady curves in our rented Renault, I'm cleaning out the refrigerator in the gîte where we and friends, and friends have idled away September. Now, in early October, someone's fig jam and someone's black cherry preserves are left behind, with a few of Cecilia's carrots still surviving in the vegetable bin. Nearby, several bowls of olives Tony and Linda brought wait now on the drain board, fated for the black poubelle. The milk goes down the drain. Lastly, three sticky bags of succulent prunes from the markets the width of Perigord. At least half still there after pork with prunes, chicken breast with prunes, eating prunes for snacks, and eating prunes while driving curvy, empty, twisty, sun-dappled roads, some choked with deep purple shadows. And we're, we're now at the uh, aforementioned, the last two poems. And these are back in, in Oregon. I think there's two. Labor Day. Well, actually, this one isn't in Oregon, but it's back in the, in the West. Labor Day. Highway 36 never quite makes it into McDougal. It offers only a glancing blow as it ricochets off toward Denver. Everyone knows the, everyone knows the post office is being consolidated, and everyone knows what that means. Talk, too, that the frosty mug may close. So what, I think. The ones that could left for college, even if it's only the community college in Colby. Some made it to Wichita, but if the army doesn't get them, most came back and most are still in Colby, working at Orsheen's or frying wontons at the China Buffet. I haven't been back since 1981, and that was on a lark. When you get to be an old man and you hear the death of a past lover in some distant place, it's always September. You're closing the cabin at the lake, latching the shutters, draining the pipes, and pulling the thick red fuses from the rusty electrical panel on the back porch, making ready for winter. Mm. Highway 95. It's not a town, but if you're heading south, it's the last excuse you'll find for ice and gas for quite a while. If it were a town, it would remind me of every dog who ever ran off or every teacup I ever broke. Some days, the sky gods or the lords of physics hang over Rome Station, a surly black beast with glittering eyes. But today, the sky is a cerulean and cobalt vestment draped over the stooping shoulders of the low range to the east. The first few million stars are back again. Rome Station sits back from its baked highway in a stand of silver maples. At the moment, it smells of hay and honey and diesel. Only another hundred miles, not too far to go to see if she still feels the same about you. Thank you.